Hope you're doing well. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's webinar. I think we're just going to go ahead and get right into it, if you don't mind. I'm just ready and excited to start talking about some branding, which, ex which is exactly the topic that we're going to be talking about today. So you should be able to see me and eventually hear some of the different sounds that I have in this. But today we're going to be talking about building your authorpreneur brand, which is really exciting. I love talking about branding. I've talked about it more than once uh, on my channel. If you've poked into the channel once or twice or, or seen any of my videos, but um, this is part of a six part webinar series that I'm going to be doing every other week, every other, every other week, a new topic is going to be introduced. Um, today's all about branding. So let's just go ahead and get right into it. So like I mentioned, this is a six part series. It is intended primarily for nonfiction authors, entrepreneurs, or anyone wanting to solidify themselves as an author. They just want to write books all day and, create stories. Branding definitely goes into that as well. So feel free to ask questions, um, you know, in the comments below, um, and I'll be sure to get to them. But um, I'm really excited to start talking about this. So during our time together, I really want to make it worth, uh, worth the time for you. So there's three things that I promise to do by the end of this uh, webinar. The first one being you're going to be able to identify your brand voice and tone. The second one being that you are going to be more aware of different uh, techniques or best practices that you can do to maintain consistency with your brand. And then finally, we're going to be looking at a couple real life examples sprinkled throughout this presentation that we'll be analyzing together and that you can use and adopt for any of your own efforts. So really great stuff that's going to be happening in this time together, my goal is to get this to be within about 45 minutes, 50 an hour at the maximum. So I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I do want to go over some stuff. So in case you're not familiar with who I am, what I do, who the heck Lauren is, I'm an author, I'm a YouTuber, and I'm a content marketer. Basically, I help entrepreneurs and small service-based business owners increase their visibility through various forms of content marketing with books being my specialty. Um, I know a lot about books. I don't know everything, but I'd like to think that I know a decent amount. And I love talking about the book to brand pipeline. I love talking about how storytelling integrates with digital marketing. There's so many good things that can come out of stories when you're combining it with lots of other cool creative marketing elements. That's my jam. So I, because that's my jam, I tend to position myself at the fulcrum between books and business. I really nerd out about that kind of thing. So if you've seen any of my other videos before, you might've seen me talk about the business of books and how books are a business and how there's, you know, all kinds of things, all kinds of things that go into it. This is not my first rodeo. I've delivered uh, workshops and webinars at conferences, at libraries. I've done them online, um, live streams. I've done them over meetup. Sometimes I'm over on meetup.com. That's a fun place to be. And finally, the YouTube videos that I do create usually, like I said, combine the power of storytelling with digital marketing, because in my opinion, only good things can come out of telling stories. People really like stories and hearing stories. So I have a question that I want to ask you because it can be a little bit of a little uncomfortable for people to think of themselves as a brand, especially creative people that that's it can be a little uncomfortable. Sometimes I have three questions or a, a few things that I want to ask you. Are you trying to sell something? Whoops. Are you trying to bring awareness to something? Are you trying to build your credibility or authority in some kind of way? And or are you trying to teach something? If you're trying to do any of those things, my argument is that that does make you a brand. You qualify as a brand if you're trying to do any of those things because you're trying to get people's attention. And you try to do that through creating a controlled perception. A brand has a lot of visual elements to it like logos, like fonts, like colors, all that stuff's really cool and exciting, but that's a visual way of communicating something a lot deeper, which is your intent, which is your values, which is really an experience or some kind of association that you're wanting to provide. An experience being, hey, read my book, go to my website, join the community, da, 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 da. And, you know, the other being, um, you know, like, uh, um, hey, you know, I really want to be known for doing this. Therefore, I'm going to be 
you know, doing a lot of activities or promotion or um, provide value in some kind of way to the point that people will be able to associate X thing or X experience with me, Brene Brown being the first one that comes to mind. When you think of vulnerability, a lot of people think of Brene Brown. When you think of sparking joy, you think of Marie Kondo. So a brand does a lot of different things, a couple of those being just a few examples. So as far as identifying your tone and voice, I do think we need to go over a couple of definitions to make sure that we're both starting off on the right foot. So just to clarify some things, tone is the emotional inflection and personality that is infused into your brand's communications, whereas voice is the consistent expression of a brand through words and maybe even writing styles. If you're an author, if you do blogs, if you you do newsletters or posts, And that's about conveying your brand personality. So they're really similar, but just distinct enough that they each deserve their own definitions. So if you're still a little bit confused by the definitions and you're having a hard time separating them in your brain, because that was me, um, I've got a couple little helpful examples. So you can never go wrong with a nice little Venn diagram. So tone has to do with inflection. Tone has to do with aligning with your values. Tone is going to vary depending on who you're speaking to and the context in which you're speaking, whether you're literally speaking, whether you're speaking through a book, whether you're speaking through a podcast or um, some other visual elements like text, whatever. Tone is how you say something, right? It's how you present something. Whereas voice, a lot of it has to do with personality, right? Your voice is your personality. It's your rhythm. It's your vocabulary, right? It's But both of these things ultimately come together to spark connection, right? People want to feel like they're able to build and establish a connection with you because gradually they begin to like, know, and trust you. And those are some really super powerful things that that can happen. In fact, I've got some stats to back this up because I don't want you to think I'm being all fluffy. Um, you know, no harm in that, but I just, I want to make sure that we're kind of grounded 86%. And I, I don't know where people got these pools of data. I don't know who they got them from, but either way, I still think that they're important. Almost 90% of consumers consider a brand's authenticity important when deciding what brands they like and support. That is powerful. Uh, almost 60% of customers base their trust Uh, in a brand on customer experience, which often includes communication style. I'm not going to read all of these, but you can kind of get an idea of just how important that kind of perception, that branding, that communication can be and how people tend to interpret them, right? People tend to trust you more. People like you because your values align. People want to feel understood and seen and represented, right? There are only good things that can come out of getting really clear on your branding, on your voice, on your values, on your mission, on your audience, all super important stuff. I've talked about defining your ideal target audience. Um, If you want to go check that out, you just go to my channel, hit the live tab, and it should be under there um, if you want to go down that rabbit hole. Otherwise, we're mostly going to be focusing on your voice and really getting that set up and established because that that can be kind of a cool experience. So we're going to do a super quick activity, which is that I'm going to be showing you a few different brands that do the same thing, but do them differently, just so you can kind of get a better understanding of of tone and personality and voice and all that stuff. So think about Gillette versus the Dollar Shave Club. They both do the same thing. They both sell razors. Gillette, however, maybe has more of an elevated experience. They're known for having high quality razors that are represented in their pricing. These things are not cheap. They're high quality. They're for someone who wants a really close shave it's sleek, it's chic, it's professional versus maybe Dollar Shave Club, you know, they acknowledge, hey, you know, not everyone can afford a $50 razor or something. You know, our our razors are pretty good quality, but you don't need to pay nearly as much. This is just for the average guy who just needs a quick shave and he's out the door. Not a problem, right? They both do the same thing, but they do it in very different ways. So interesting. Next one is iPhone versus Android, the ever popular, ever infamous debate between the two. I'm an iPhone person. My uh, fiance is an Android person. We fight about it all the time. I'm right. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, but they both do, they're, they're both phones, right? But they have different interfaces. They have different functionalities and capabilities. I personally really like the interface of phone. And I think Android is a little bit clunky for whatever reason, Android's interface does not align with the way that my brain works. But 
my partner often says that the quality of the camera is better or that they have more features on the phone. It really just depends on what you value, right? Which is why it's important to define your values. We're going to be doing that in a bit. But my final example for you bookish people is e-readers versus physical books. For me, e-readers uh, or Kobos or Kindles or whatever, to me, they scream um, convenience, efficiency, right? If I'm traveling a lot, I don't want to cart around five different books. That's going to end up being like 10 pounds of weight that I don't need. Why not download a bunch of books for a few dollars less? It's more cost effective and just take a small little device everywhere with me versus maybe a book might be uh, targeted to people who just kind of want to chill. They want to crack open a book. They're laying on the beach. They might want to have a slower morning or a slower evening and just take some time for themselves. Both of them do the same thing, but have completely different experiences, right? So those are just a few examples of things that do the same thing, but accomplish it in different ways. And people like them for those varying reasons. So Let's get into the meat of it, which is identifying your unique voice. There's three ways that you're going to do this. The first one being, I've, I've already used this word a lot and it's only been 15 minutes. <laughs> you're going to reflect on your values. These can be personal or professional. Think about what you want to convey. And I'm going to be showing you how to do all of this too. Reflect on your values because the values that you create for yourself or your brand are going to be the heart of your brand. So if you're an author, this might be more of like a hybrid approach where you are the face of your brand. So it might take on a more personal kind of touch. Um, if you are an entrepreneur or you're using a book as a marketing tool to attract a new clients or something, you know, maybe your brand's values are a little more professional because you want people to ultimately put their eyes and ears and attention on your business or on being a client or something like that, right? The second thing that you want to consider, which I've already mentioned, is your target audience. Um, feel free to check out that uh, previous webinar that I did. It's on my YouTube channel if you want. Very, very in-depth, but we need to consider who your target audience is, where they hang out, what they want to hear. And this looks like not only understanding their language, but also speaking their language and hanging out where they're hanging out, right? Putting yourself in front of the platforms that they frequent the most. And then the third thing being that you want to find your ideal communication style based on your target audience information and the values that you create for yourself and your brand that ultimately determines your delivery style. So this is very like high level sort of TLDR, too long, didn't read overviews, but you know, 30,000 foot view for how all of this works. So I'm going to be going through each of these, showing you how to do it. So as far as your values go, there's a few different ways that you can do this. Like I said, your values are important because this is going to act as the heart of your brand. It not only influences how you communicate your brand experience, but it also helps people to better understand what they can experience from it, right? Because what was that? There was a stat back there, which was that 53% uh, of people feel connected to a brand when they feel like they align with their values. So there's a lot of importance to that. Let me just get back up to speed here. So the first thing that you want to consider is what do you want people to associate with either you, your brand and or your business? It's going to vary depending on if you have more of a personal approach versus a more professional approach. If you're, if you're just wanting to be an author or just wanting to exercise your own thought leadership, maybe versus being a business owner or trying to sell a product or a service or an experience or something like that. It's very common as you grow to, um, separate those brands, separate those brands out because I've, I've, I've worked with people before where their book has its own landing page with, with its own branding. Their website, suzysmith.com has its own branding. And then Susie Smith's business, Smith Incorporated maybe, has a third separate type of branding. So it's not meant to make things complicated, but it is meant to show that there is a different experience or different values or, you know, like it that that there is variation between those three things, right? I hope that makes sense. And you're going to want to choose between three to five of these to convey. Um, I have my own set of values. Mine are authenticity, balance, connection, dependability, and simplicity. And there's a few different ways that you can find this. So if you're not totally sure where to start, find a competitor. This could be a, a 
uh, an author that you feel like you're similar to. This could be another brand, another business or something that you want to align yourself with that really seems like they kind of have, have a lot going for them. Take note of what they're doing by asking ChatGPT, hey, who is the ideal profile, client profile, reader profile, buyer profile for this book, this brand, this business? In fact, I'll go back up so you can kind of see what this looks like. Can you please give me the ideal reader profile of someone who would benefit from an author like James Clear? He wrote the book Atomic Habits in case you're not super familiar with him, but it, it gives you such detailed information. You get demographics, you get psychographics, you get values, what they value, right? You get goals, behavior traits, platforms that they frequent, social media platforms, their online activity, their purchase behavior. Using that kind of language, ideal blank, is going to give you a lot of great information like this. So think about who's similar to you in audience, in style, in content, in approach, in process, or anything else that you can think of. And then ask ChatGPT for that brand's values. So as you can see right here, I said, what values are most represented within James Clear's brand? Again, he's the author of Atomic Habits. And it, I think it spat out like seven, seven or 10 of them. So I'm not necessarily saying that you need to copy and paste what these people are doing, but use it to inform your own efforts, right? We're working smarter, not necessarily harder here. The other thing that you can do too as you can just find any old list on the internet, I pulled this one from Brene Brown's website called Dare to Lead. It's just a free PDF copy that I downloaded. And for me and my brand personally, I just cherry picked those five values that I mentioned earlier about authenticity, balance, da, 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 da. Some I pulled from this list, some I pulled from others, some I just thought of on my own. Um, so you can use ChatGPT to give you values and profiles of other brands. You can find a list and just kind of pick what you like. A third option that I didn't list here, um, but I also think is important is you can just ask people what they associate with you. If you're going for a more personal brand or a professional brand. If you're going personal, you might want to ask your friends, your neighbors, your family, your family friends. If you're going for more of a professional brand, you might want to ask your colleagues. If you have like a boss that you're close to and that you trust, if you work for a small company or something, you might ask their marketing team leader or something like that. Um, but these are just a few ways that you can identify your values. It's not rocket science. You're just you're practicing clarity around the things that you care about, right? And that you want other people to care about with you. So part two is considering your audience. And this is basically a super quick recap of the target audience webinar that I gave a while ago that's available on my YouTube channel. The reason that you want to be hyper clear on your target audience is that you know, is, is that because you know who they are, you're going to be able to provide a lot more value and that eventually build a symbiotic relationship with them because you understand their goals, because you understand their challenges, their values, they feel seen, right? They feel, they feel like you get them without them having to tell you what they want or educate you on what they want. So think about who would benefit the most from your efforts. Consider the forest and the tree, right? So in the, in the case of authorship, let's say, for example, that might look like considering your ideal readership all of the potential readers, the group of readers that you really want to attract versus the individual reader and what they think, what they feel, what keeps them up at night, the kinds of stories that they're just dying to read. I think it's kind of a healthy exercise to consider the group and the individual. Consider where they're at, where they hang out, where they get their information, the types of social media platforms that they frequent. And then finally, think about what they want to hear. So you're going to be considering all of this information on the screen to almost sort of anticipate what they want to hear, the answers that they want to get, the experience that they want to have, the solutions that they need, right? What's their language? What's it, what's their language? Where do they hang out? And how is that going to inform your delivery style, right? Meaning your tone, meaning your voice, meaning your personality, right? It's no different than walking into a group full of people saying, hey, sounds like you guys are needing help with this. I actually do X, Y, Z, or I actually write write content or write books about X, Y, Z. So here's how to do this. Again, this is the, like the TLDR version of that previous webinar that I gave. Find a competitor because we're all about data over here. We're all about working smarter, not harder. So this looks like if you're an author, research comp titles on Amazon. If you don't know what that is, comp titles is short for competitive or comparable titles. And I know people have funky feelings about Amazon, but the reason that I mention them is because they are one of the biggest e-retailer platforms in the world. And they also started out writing books or uh, uh, 
distributing books. And then they also have a lot of categories to choose from as broad or as niche as you want to go. Um, the niche you go, the more specific kinds of titles and books and authors and audiences you're going to get. So play around, see what you find. If you're an entrepreneur or a business owner, that this might look like identifying a very small handful of businesses that are similar to yours in size, niche, services, approach, et cetera. From there, ask ChatGPT, who is the ideal reader profile for? If you're an entrepreneur or a business owner, ask ChatGPT, who is the ideal client or ideal buyer for a business like blank? Um, and it's going to give you all that information, demographics, psychographics, habits, behaviors, all that good stuff. From there, if you want to take it a step further, you can identify keywords that they maybe use when Googling resources about blank or when seeking help or wanting to hire out support with blank, or if looking for books about blank. This is really, really great for SEO, search engine optimization, which is one of one of the greatest digital marketing tactics out there because it's, it's a word association. Words do you want to have be associated with you, right? Brene Brown's all about vulnerability. Marie Kondo's all about sparking joy. So ask ChatGBT to do the work for you. If you want to do some of your own research, go for it. See what it comes up with. And if you want to take it even further, you can use a website like SparkToro. Um, it's free. I think you need an account, um, but you get like five free searches or something like that. And you can plug in some of those keywords or some of those similar websites if you want to get a deeper breakdown of the audience that frequents platform, you know, digital platforms, the type of other search terms that they're looking for, the type of content that they absorb, similar people in, you know, similar niches. And ultimately, you're going to be leveraging all of that information to inform what social platforms you should be on, what your delivery type is, your SEO, right, those keywords. But most importantly, it's going to help with your language, right, so you can connect to your target audience. I would definitely recommend this if you have um, more of like a broader sort of uh, brand that you're going for, like life coaching, for example, um, you might need to get really, really clear on what makes you unique or what particular subset of that target audience you want to target just because that type of landscape is so competitive versus maybe something like um, workplace anniversaries. Uh, I worked, I briefly worked with a guy and that was his niche. He was the first one to write a book on work anniversaries. Uh, his name is Rick Joy. That's his real last name. And it's all about workplace anniversaries and his book is doing very, very well. He's done a lot of great stuff. So this is really great. If you're, if you're wanting to get into a really broad category, um, it just kind of helps you niche down a little bit. So I would definitely recommend that for those of you who that resonates with. As far as finding your voice, this is where I think we really start getting into the meat of the hamburger. So as a reminder, voice is your brand's personality that's often conveyed through tone, rhythm, and vocabulary. How do you find this? You get super clear on your target audience. I, I'm sorry, but you're never going to get away from that. Get really clear on your values. Think about what makes you unique based on all of that information, based on what your skill sets are, based on what credentials you have, based on the experience that you have, based on maybe what other people have to say about you. Once you have this information, it's up to you to determine how you want to communicate this. And I've got some supporting material to help you along with that. So here's where we're really going to get into it. I'm going to show you how to come up with your own branding. And what I mean by that is taking everything that you've thought about so far, about your values slash mission, about your message, as well as about how to communicate that message, taking all of that, you want to represent that visually. You want to just kind of package it up all super nice and neatly and make it look really pretty to look at because people like looking at pretty things. So I'm going to show you how to do that. If you have access to Pinterest, whatever quality or value you want to be associated with, plug that into Instagram and put aesthetic after it. Honestly, plug in your values and then aesthetic. See what comes up. See what you resonate with. So that's words of wisdom from past Lauren. So here's an example. If I value creativity, I just looked up creativity aesthetic on Pinterest. These were some of the images that I got. And maybe you're able to tell some similarities that they have, color similarities that they have. There's a lot of paintbrushes involved. If that's not me, maybe I'm going for a more natural theme. So I type in natural aesthetic. I feel like this has more of a cohesive kind of look to it. You've got a lot of flowers. You've got a lot of valleys and hills. You've got 
clouds and sunshine, just kind of play around with different words that you want to be associated with or the kinds of um, the vibe that you want to go for. I'm sorry to tell you, but a lot of this has to do with vibe. So I might be using that word more than once. But play around on Pinterest or on Instagram, wherever you're most comfortable and take some time to kind of see what resonates with you or what you think might resonate with the audience that you're targeting, right? The kind of stuff that they're maybe looking up, the kind of pins that they're pinning. So when I was building out my own brand, a lot of these were the images that stuck with me. These were the ones that I thought, oh yeah, that's nice. Or Ooh, that feels like me, or that goes for the vibe that I, that I kind of want. I was looking at a lot of pictures that I almost like aspired to to have or to be, right? I would just, I would love to have a bedroom like this. This bedroom looks incredibly comfortable. I would love to have outfits like these two things. I wish I could draw like in the similar style of this. So when I was starting out, my brand was very personal because I was a writer. I was trying to get published. I was building up my own brand. So I stuck with what I know, which was me. I'm a very self-aware person. So I was looking at things that felt like me, that resonated with me, that I felt best visually represented the best parts of who I am, the best parts that I have to give. And these are some of the images that I came up with. And eventually what I did, excuse me, was I took a look at all these pictures and I thought, what words describe these? Like what what am I, what kind of, you know, uh, qualities am I getting from these pictures? And these are the words that came to mind. Business casual, right? I, like Lauren in real life, me, I love a good pair of jeans. I'm such a jeans girl. I'm going to wear jeans with anything and everything with a sweatshirt, with tank top, with a nice blouse, with a blazer. I really love jeans. So I like anything that's business casual. I also think that a lot of these a lot of these pieces are conversational. Like I would wear a nice pair of jeans and a good sweater out to a coffee shop to catch up with a friend, talk with them about what's going on in their life, get a good conversation going. If they want to pick my brain, they can. Whatever I did, I want I wanted there to be a conversation involved. I I really love nothing more than a good pair of jeans and a good conversation. <laughs> quality. A lot of these are very quality images. They're very they're very nice. Like they're kind of expensive. You got a Gucci belt here. I'm not necessarily one for labels, but I do appreciate quality. And that's what a lot of these pieces kind of exuded for me. A lot of these pieces are balanced. You have these really light, airy colors with also kind of darker, more grounded colors. You have brown, you have black, you've got gray. I really like brown as a grounding color for whatever reason. It's just always resonated with me. And so grounded. And so those were kind of all of the words that came to mind when I was this looking at my... this. Oops. So based on all that information, Pass Lauren's going to spit some more words of wisdom here. This is my quote mood board. These are all pictures that I really like, that I feel like look like me, that feel like me, that represent my values. There's some of that groundedness with some of the light and airiness. And I feel like that's kind of the sort of vibe that best reflects me and what my values are, what my mission is. If you're already an avid Pinterest user, you can just kind of go off of previous pins that you've liked or that you've interacted with. But either way, have some fun kind of looking around and put it all into this mood board right here. And this is what you're going to use when you hop over to Canva and you start putting together your little brand board. So all I did was you go up here and you just type in brand board right here, as you can see. And these are all the templates that it's going to pull up for me. So I just picked, honestly, I think this was the one that I picked right here, this Olivia Wilson fashion blogger. You can always change what they have, but I'm gonna go ahead and click on it. And what you can do is once you kind of find some pictures that are representative of yourself on Pinterest, to find those exact colors just to give you a starting point, click on one of the little default color swatches, click on this little color icon up here, and then you're gonna click on this little eyedropper tool. And then you're gonna hover that over some colors that you particularly want to highlight. So if I'm just going to do this blue color, that's like the sky with the hands raised, click on that and it's going to pop up on the screen and it's going to give you that exact hex number. And a hex number is basically like a color's thumbprint. It's like the ISBN number of a book. It's the unique identifier for that particular color. Every single color is going to have a hex number. Don't let that freak you out. It's no different than sky blue, but like the more technical version of it. Okay, so that was a lot of super technical information. Um, if you weren't able to follow it, that's totally fine. It kind of started to get a little bit granular, so but 
basically what I did is- was I picked out a few of my favorite pictures from this board and then I went over to Canva. So all I did if you're was- not super familiar with Canva, um, it's nothing that's too complicated. It's like a really user-friendly version of like Adobe or any of those like more uh, in-depth graphic design type tools. I'm not quite at that level myself. So Canva is a really, really great resource for finding templates or for like getting started on graphic materials. So I just picked out a few of my favorite colors and I hovered my little cursor over it. And then it gave me the exact color of that shade that I was looking for. And eventually I played it, I played around with enough colors to inform my brand board. And I created the, this isn't totally accurate. Some of my colors have changed a little bit, but the theme is still very, very accurate. I'm not a book launcher anymore. That's what I used to be. Um, But this is my brand board. And I took some of those favorite colors. And as you can see, you kind of get a vibe for it. You get a feel for it. The colors match up with it really well. Because this is something that's like professional, but still kind of laid back. I wanted to, and I was writing at the time, I was trying to be an author. I thought, you know, some kind of handwritten font would be a really nice way of kind of communicating that, you know, I'm laid back, I'm creative, I'm a writer, but I also kind of like the Roboto sort of font where it kind of grounds things a little bit and it's simple and it's clear and it's straightforward. I love that kind of look. So that's what I went for. And I still use these colors to this day. If you've done branding work before, um, I've heard that it's usually good to do it. I don't know, every five years, maybe I would probably say every few years, it, it gets to be a little bit too frequent, but you can reinvent yourself more than once. Just like you can launch a book more than once if you want to, um, not to get off topic, but if you, if you launch a book or publish a book and it doesn't give you the reaction that you want, you can just do it again. It's called a relaunch. Um, and they do that for books and brands, sometimes even businesses too. So that's all super cool stuff. We're just kind of playing around here. You are more than welcome to hire out services or support for this kind of thing. But if you don't mind a bit of a do-it-yourself kind of attitude, you know, these are some ways for how to do that. In terms of consistency, I think it really, really helps to have a universal social media handle. And if you're not super familiar with that, a handle is like, it's your username that's associated with your social media profile. So typically having it as just your name or if you write under a pen name, if you're an author or if you're a business owner um, and you have like a different business name, you know, S- Susie Smith Incorporated might be your handle versus someone like me where I just use my regular name. It's Lauren Erickson. But when I tried to get the handle spelled just correctly, Lauren Erickson, it was taken. So I resorted to changing the O in my last name to a zero. And that's pretty much the same handle that I use for a lot of the platforms I'm on, which is Instagram, YouTube. I think those are the two main ones. And then as far as like color palettes and some of those more visual materials, any kind of customizable platform, you can absolutely implement those fonts, those colors, those logos. Um, maybe even some like graphic effects or something like like that if you're a brush stroke person. Um, a newsletter is a good example of that. A blog is a good example of that. A website is probably the best example of that. Any kind of promotional materials, if you're an author, if you've got a conference coming up that you're going to and you need to put like business cards or something together, a lot of these things are really, really good for like any kind of marketing material. A podcast one sheet, if you didn't know, sometimes it can be really helpful to just put all of your information on one sheet that you can give to a podcast host, um, as the name implies. And it's just a really quick, easy, scannable informational um, p- page for them, really. So you can do a lot with this kind of stuff. And it makes you seem really, really professional. So we're going to be kind of comparing and contrasting an example of two brands that accomplish the same thing or a couple different brands that that kind of have their own feel to it. So this one is called Soft White Underbelly and that's a YouTube channel that I've been watching for probably a good two years or so. I really, really like them. And the guy, his name is Mark, who made the channel, he has a background in photography. And I want to say he used to snap photos for Apple or some something really prestigious like that. But his photography is really, really amazing. And so he's got a studio where he interviews a lot of different people. A lot of these people are a little more road hard. They're um, more outcast, like social outcasts, I would say. And some of it gets pretty deep, gets pretty dark, but he gives them a really high quality platform to tell their story or to share their experience. And he's got a very large variety of people that that come on his channel. So this is an example of one who's a divorce attorney. Because, you know, I, 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 as a grown man who's divorced, 
when you're when you're 20 and you say oh that's my girlfriend nobody thinks anything of it when you're 50 and you say oh that's my girlfriend people go oh, there's a story there like because you're either divorced or commitment phobic or why do you have a girlfriend when you're 50 why isn't that your wife and if you hang around long enough to see these videos the snapshot that you see on my screen right now, he takes it and as the subject is talking, he'll pan down because it's a full body portrait that he takes of every single person that comes on his show. It's so interesting and I love the content. So this is what I think of when I see or experience or watch a soft white underbelly video. As a consumer, I don't know if this is what Mark is going for, the guy who made the channel, but just as a consumer, this is what I'm picking up. In terms of visuals, a lot of these people are very, very unfiltered. A lot of these different types of conversations can get a lot of different opinions going, get a lot of different feelings going. Sometimes, usually Mark, the guy who makes it, will kind of stand back and let them run the show, and he very, very rarely interrupts. But every once in a while, he'll prompt people and be like, hey, what was your childhood like? Or did you finish high school? Or, you know, what is one of your biggest regrets in life? Just to kind of keep the conversation going. So I really appreciate that. It's very real. It's very candid. It's very authentic. And it's all captured through very, very high quality visual materials, video and photography being his, his primary sources. And all of this is communicated in black and white full body portrait photography versus maybe Humans of New York. I don't know if you're familiar with that platform. They were really big in the 2010s, I feel like. But it's a guy named Brandon, also a photographer. He lost his job and suddenly started snapping pictures of people on the sidewalks of New York City, created an entire brand around it. He does the same thing, but the people he targets are very, very different. Um, I don't have his example in this slide, but if you go over to his Instagram or something, you'll see that a lot of his photos are of people you know, who are working or they're taking their kid to work. Or, you know, it's a high-end fashion designer or something like that. And his look is a lot more eclectic, right? Versus um, Marx, who, who who produces Softwood Underbelly, his is very dark. It's very real. It's very raw. So example of a brand that does the same thing in different ways. So how to practice consistency, right? Why, why, do, why do we need consistency with our branding? It helps reinforce your brand's personality. People respond very well to consistency in general. Anytime there's a routine, people know what to expect. It's always going to be really attractive. So different platforms attract different audiences with different ways of speaking. As you begin to cement your brand, you might just want to keep that in mind with the type of register that you have. If it's very casual and you hang out on a place like Reddit, or if it's very professional because you hang out on a place like LinkedIn, right? Your brand language, this is what you're communicating textually, visually, through audio. You want to express your brand. It's conversations that you're starting, values that you have, products or services or communities that you're promoting. You want your language to be very, very consistent. Maybe it's casual, maybe it's formal, maybe it's humorous, maybe it's sarcastic. Um, in fact, I have a guy who does really, really great sarcastic language named Dave Harland. He's a copywriter from the UK. I'm going to be talking about him in a hot second. But this is a really, really brief snapshot of how all of the really, really popular social media platforms vary depending on age, depending on um, the types of genders that they attract on their purpose, content types that produce a lot of engagement. So if you want to take a screenshot of this, feel free. Um, I'll have a link to the full thing down in the description um, after this video, if you'd like, because this is like probably two thirds of it, half to about a two, two thirds of the full document that I, that I created. So just as a way to kind of cement that. So Dave Harlan, who's the guy that I just mentioned, he's a copywriter from the UK. And because he concerns himself with language, usually textually, um, he's got a very, very clear brand voice. And I tried to find really hyper-specific examples through like newsletters that I've gotten, but I think they were so old that my Gmail just deleted them. But this is one that I saw on his LinkedIn post where he's commenting on, you know, this guy's lack of creativity when it comes to promoting sunglasses during the summer. He says, sunglasses, they're suitable for the sun. Really, is the sky also blue? Is water also wet, right? So he's kind of poking phone poking fun at this a little bit highly recommend subscribing to him he's super super awesome the word man copy or die i mean kind of right off the bat you can get a feel for this like very dry witty sense of humor personally i love it so he gets a lot of spam messages on linkedin there's a woman named aisha supposedly who's a registered nurse 
she's trying to pick him up basically, right? She's sending a picture of himself. And the way that he responds to a lot of these inquiries is just very off the wall. He's immediately diving into his life troubles in an attempt to kind of scare off these people who are targeting him, right? He's wasting their time because they're wasting his time. So, you know, he's saying, oh, hey, I'm kind of having a hard time. I moved to California from New Jersey. It's hard to make friends. Um, he said, I was in invited to a beach party last week and was beaten up by a karate baddie on a motorbike and proceeded to attach a picture with his face photoshopped into like a fight scene kind of, kind of image. So he just likes to play around with words. And frankly, I'm here for it. I just really, really like it. So highly recommend checking out his newsletter. In fact, in one of his previous newsletters, he, um, was addressing a concern by a subscriber who said that they didn't like how often he uses the F word, like the four letter F word. And he's, he's, I really wish I kept it, but he had this whole newsletter dedicated to talking about why that's a part of his brand. It's just very natural for him to speak that way. His audience very generally likes it. It sets him apart. It's one of his unique factors, just saying it how it is. So when I think of Dave Harlan, copywriter, copy or die, word man, this is what I think of. He's very quick witted. He's got a really dry sense of humor that I really like personally. He's got very conversational language, as, as you can tell from these screenshots. He leverages something that he already has, which is industry expertise around copywriting. He's got decades of experience, and he communicates this through text. He finds that text is the best communication medium to exercise all of these different brand elements through, right? So again, highly recommend checking him out. I really like him. In terms of scheduling, I know that we're getting up to the 45 minute mark. So as promised, I'm going to try to keep it short and not delay this anymore. But if you're someone who struggles with content scheduling, these are a few suggestions that I have, right? So a content pillar model is a really, really great way to keep and maintain a branded conversation around certain topics that pertain to the kind of stuff that you like to talk about, your brand, right? The tone, the personality, the language. So I'm going to be talking about what that is, as well as some tools that I've personally used myself that I've created for myself. Links to that are also going to be in the description in case you're interested. This is what a content pillar model looks like. You have a very foundational topic at the top, a few supplemental topics underneath it, and then really super clear specific topics underneath those ones. Again, it's called a content pillar model. So if you want to see a very, very basic version of this, this is what it looks like. Hi, my name is Lauren. I really like talking about food. Specifically, I really like talking about fruits, vegetables, and meats. Even more specifically, I like talking about bananas, apples, strawberries, carrots, broccoli, cabbage, beef, pork, and chicken. That's my brand. Those are all the things I really like talking about. And it might seem a little bit limiting. Some people might not like that they have to kind of put themselves into a box. I'm not really saying that you need to do that, but I am saying that you need to give people direction and consistency so that they know what to anticipate anytime they enter into a room that you're in, whether physically or virtually. So this was mine when I was starting out and I was creating my brand a couple few years ago and I was kind of playing around with things. Um, I like talking about books. I'm known as the book person, a person who concerns herself with books. More specifically, I like talking about writing and publishing and marketing. Nowadays, I lean a little bit more into the marketing side of things, but for a while at the beginning of my channel, it was a lot of publishing related stuff, which is still really fun for me to dive into. But this is the kind of stuff that I really like to talk about. And, you know, I managed to create a, a YouTube channel around it. And for a while I was, I had a good streak going on, on Instagram, but I found that that was a lot to keep up with. So I transitioned over to YouTube, but um, this was what my content pillar model was. And for the most part, you know, I, I don't like look at it explicitly now just because I know what kinds of topics are on brand for me now without having to make something like this. But if you're starting out, it might just be a good exercise. You can just grab a blank sheet of paper. You don't need a template or anything unless you want one, but, um, feel free to just kind of do a brain dump, see what happens. Um, the other thing I did too, was I just asked chat GPT, Hey, oops, can you please make a three month content marketing plan for this particular platform. This is my audience. These are my goals. This is what I'm wanting. And then chat GPT spat out three months of content broken up into weekly themes with objectives. I am very much a checklist person. So if this strikes your fancy, um, definitely consider doing it. I find it really helpful. And then what I did was I took all of this information and I organized it into a Trello board. I don't know if you're familiar with Trello. Um, but it's basically a task management tool. It's free. You can upgrade and all that stuff. But for me, I find the free version is 
just perfect for me. So I don't pay anything for it. And, um, I broke it, I, I broke it up into weekly themes, right? So as you can see, I clicked on the August 1st one, I think, right? Yeah. I clicked on that. And then I basically made a checklist for myself. So every week I don't have to think about, oh gosh, what am I going to do this week? I just pop in my Trello because chat GPT told me to do it. And because I agreed with it and I tweaked parts of it, it came out with something that I really like that I have to work on every week. And I really like that because it saves me time, saves me mental bandwidth, and I don't have to think too hard about it. And it gives me content for my YouTube channel, for my shorts, if I want to make supplemental material in the form of shorts, and my Patreon, because I recently started Patreon. It's a dollar a month, in case you're curious. <laughs> so this is a method that I still use to this day. It's relatively recent. I've been using it for about the past two months or so, and I really like it. And oftentimes for my YouTube videos, like how to find your brand's voice, I'll just put the entire script to the video in this little comment bar at the bottom, and it works perfect for me. So that's one. Another one that I used to use, I didn't feel like it was personally sub sustainable for me, but I used a content calendar on like a Google sheet. And this is a snapshot of what it looked like. Um, I created this myself because I couldn't find one that I liked enough on the internet. So I made this and it, it's it got enough so that I could do two posts a day if I wanted to, just because I was starting out. So I would click the platform, the content type. If you click on it, it's got photo, it's got video, it's got short, it's got blog, it's got text, it's got um, you know, audio, podcast clip, whatever. And I would use this to kind of organize my month. And then as I go along, I would update the status of each one to published, to scheduled, to completed, to in progress, to behind, right? So if you're interested in playing around with something like this, again, I'll leave it in the description below, a free template just for you because I like you. So that's that. This is a stats tracker for... And this is a stats tracker that to this day I still use and I've been using it for the past year or so. I bought it off the internet for like $10 and I really like it. Um, and I use this to track stats every month across my website, YouTube, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Those are the main platforms where I concern myself, YouTube being my primary one. So every month I go into the analytics on the back end of each of these platforms and I just type in number of subscribers that I have, number of new subscribers I attracted, number of unique viewers, watch time, all that stuff. So if this, again, in the description, if this kind of stuff strikes your fancy, I think you're really going to like the next webinar topic. So I'll do a quick plug around that at the very end. But I, I did promise that I was going to do three things during our time together, which was help you define your voice and tone, which I hope I did. So these are the bullet points for how we did it. We found our values by checking out competitors, going to chat GPT, um, pulling out keywords. We did that both for values and audience. We found, we used visual materials to inform our voice by using Pinterest, creating a mood board, and maybe even creating a brand board if you want to take it a step further. I uh, showcased some best practices when it comes to consistency for visual identification, social handles, just having one across the board is always a good idea and a brand board to inform your brand efforts visually across newsletters, blogs, websites, business cards, flyers, podcasts, one sheets, whatever, message and tone, social platforms, your audience, that all informs your language. Showed you a couple different scheduling tools that I use, um, content management tools. And then these were some of the real life examples that we looked at, Soft White Underbelly and Dave Harland, the copy or die uh, copywriter man. So <laughs> I hope this was all helpful. Um, I always love talking about that stuff. So like I said, if you would like to learn more about the content creation side of things specifically, if you kind of liked tuning into the um, uh, content management stuff with those scheduling tools, I think you're really going to like this. So it's going to be in the form of a webinar, just like this one on YouTube. You can register by scanning that QR code. Otherwise, it's all going to be, it, it's on my channel already if you want to click the button to get notified. So just head over to my YouTube channel, Lauren Erickson, but the O in my last name is a zero. And I'm going to be giving a workshop and hanging out at a super cool event in February in downtown Chicago called CreativeCon. It's super awesome. I hope you can make it. It's a really great uh, place to be if you're a creative entrepreneur or author. Publishers have been there before. TEDx speakers have been there before. Um, media personalities have been there before. So it's really great for networking workshops, meeting keynote speakers, um, list tuning into different panels. Great, great fun. So head over to creativecon.com for tickets if you want that. Otherwise, that's all I got. Um, All my information is going to be right up here on the screen. I hope you found it valuable. 
feel free to leave me any feedback too. As long as it's constructive, I don't care if it's positive or negative. I just care that I get feedback on how I'm doing. So it's a little bit hard to read the label out outside of the pick outside of the pickle jar, if you know what I mean. So <laughs> I hope you got something out of this. I'll see you next time and feel free to ask any questions in the comments down below. Take care and I'll see you next time.